It's the end of December, which means it's time to recap the development of Pantheon Rise of the Fallen over the past 365 days and honestly ask ourselves, is it really any closer to release? Before we begin, I want to point out that if you're not up to speed with what's happened in past years of Pantheon's development and don't know why it's taking so long, then you're missing out on a lot of important context. Much of what was done this year has its roots in last year and years before that. So if you haven't already, pause this video right now and go watch the saga of Pantheon's development thus far, which summarizes with sources all of the major events from Pantheon's announcement in 2014 through 2021, because this isn't your typical game development process. And if you don't know how Pantheon got to where it was at the beginning of 2022, then anything after that probably isn't going to make much sense. This year in review was put together with the help of the Library of Pantheon, which is a website I helped put together that acts as a free living archive of everything Vision Realms has publicly released about Pantheon. While there were a lot of important interviews and roundtables in 2022, for the purposes of this video, I'm going to focus on the primary events that affected the reality of the game itself. I understand that many people only care about when the release date is, but the fact is that you'll never get to release or even beta without first getting to alpha, which is Pantheon's next big milestone. Alpha will be a hugely critical turning point in Pantheon's development trajectory, for better or for worse, depending on how it's received. As a crowdfunded game that's looking to get full funding from a like-minded publisher, Alpha will be the proving grounds that more or less determines the future of the Pantheon project. Regardless of whether or not you've signed up to test in Alpha, Alpha should be the focal point if you're at all interested in Pantheon. So, lest we get too far ahead of ourselves, let's first take a look at what happened in 2022 that brought Pantheon closer to Alpha. In January, Visionary Realms announced that the Visionary Realms Incorporated Network Library, aka Vinyl, has been licensed to other studios. Vinyl is a network technology created from scratch by Visionary Realms lead programmer Kyle Olson that's specifically designed for massively multiplayer games built on the Unity engine. Now, if you don't know how networking, well, works, and how vitally important it is to MMOs, I recommend watching the video I made earlier this year that explains it, at least enough to wrap your head around vinyl, because networking in general is very complicated. But historically, the Unity engine has been used primarily to make mobile games like Hearthstone, shooters like Escape from Tarkov, party games like Fall Guys and Among Us, etc. In other words, games that require information to be sent over a network to relatively small amounts of people at a time. So the existing network solutions for Unity are intended for those types of games. Vinyl stands out in the industry because it's capable of efficiently prioritizing and transmitting the incredibly high volume of network traffic that massively multiplayer online games require, while also being tailor-made to play well with Unity. Vinyl is a standalone product, separate from Pantheon, and from the sounds of things, only a couple select studios currently have a license for it. But while we don't know the details of those licensing deals, Kyle Olsen mentioned that it's, quote, not cheap. So it's possible that this is at least a decent alternate revenue stream for Visionary Realms, in addition to the investments and donations they receive. As of that point in January, Pantheon was still utilizing Unity's native network solution, Ulink, which, as I said, was simply not compatible with full-scale MMOs. This has been one of the biggest obstacles preventing Pantheon from moving into alpha testing, which will bring over 8,000 testers onto the servers. So as we'll see later, one of Visionary Realm's primary goals for Pantheon this year was to rip out Ulink and replace it with Vinyl. Before the programming team could do that, however, they had to finish Pantheon's conversion to the High Definition Render Pipeline, or HDRP, which they started in the second half of last year and was finally marked complete in March of this year. HDRP is a scriptable render pipeline for high-fidelity visuals, made by Unity for games that use the Unity engine. A render pipeline is essentially the set of instructions built into a game that your computer uses to interpret code for things that you need to see and then display it on your screen. This affects nearly every aspect of a game's appearance, though the most immediate and noticeable effect of this is the lighting. While making an MMO on the Unity engine is definitely a tall task, it does have its benefits, and this is a good example of that. 
Improvements that the Unity team makes to their engine, such as the HDRP, can directly benefit Pantheon with much less effort than if Visionary Realms had made their own engine from scratch, which is what most MMO developers do if they can afford it. Once the new pipeline was in place, developers were able to integrate other systems that were dependent on HDRP, such as procedural biome generation, which moved Pantheon's terrain firmly out of the gray box state that we got accustomed to seeing following the refactor of 2020. On top of that came the day-night cycle, water system, and the weather system. With a new graphical pipeline established, the stage was set for the art department to increase production of custom assets, while the programming team shifted their focus to the integration of vinyl. The month of May brought a lot of growth to the art team. Previously, there were only six people in Visionary Realm's art department. One animator, one 3D environment artist, one 3D character artist, two concept artists, and creative director Chris Joppa Perkins, who, while having many other responsibilities as creative director, does help with world building when he has the time. And for me personally, it's just been, it's been um, a lot of being able to get into some world building again. A lot of people probably don't know that I, I do some of that. Um, I'm not a, a modeler. I don't, I, I think I've said before, I don't build, I don't create the Legos, I, but I build with them. And so it's been really fun being able to kind of uh, get in the trenches a little bit with some of our other environment artists and um, be able to do some world building, which I've really enjoyed. Um, and with that comes, you know, the the joy of ideating a little bit with content and um, what NPCs exist here and, you know, what's kind of the general context and, and story of this area. So it's fun to be able to kind of wade into that here and there. But in May, that team of six jumped to a team of 10 with the arrival of 3D environment artist and world builder Leonardo Evangelisti, animator and rigger Dwart Ferreira, environment concept artist Brett Knuckles, and 3D character artist Tara Solbrig. And in June, the art team grew yet again with the addition of 3D environment artist Esther Shin, meaning the size of Visionary Realm's art team effectively doubled in just a couple months. July was an even bigger month for Pantheon. First, integration of vinyl in Pantheon was completed after much anticipation. As of the recording of this video, there are still a few tweaks that need to be made for everything to function properly with the seamlessness of the world, but the main surgery was done and Pantheon was now running solidly on vinyl. Visionary Realms then announced that they hired Steve Clover as a senior programmer. Steve Clover was a longtime friend of Visionary Realm's late founder, Brad McQuaid, and along with Brad was one of the co-creators of EverQuest, the first commercially successful 3D MMORPG. Steve is a bit of an unsung hero of EverQuest's success, having done a lot of the original programming for the game, as well as the design. In fact, he was the one who came up with the races, classes, starting cities, and even the name EverQuest. Now, all these years later, Steve has risen out of obscurity to join the Pantheon team and help make Brad's vision a reality. Steve hit the ground running and very quickly implemented the banking system for Pantheon, as well as the near-death mechanic. Later in July, Visionary Realms announced that they had received $2.4 million in funding from a group of private investors, bringing the total amount of investment capital raised since the beginning of the project to $5.34 million. Again, this is the total amount of private investments and does not include crowdfunding from donations. Just a few days later, CoCarnage made the surprise announcement that he was part of the group of individual investors who had just contributed that combined $2.4 million. He emphasized that he and the other anonymous investors believe in what Visionary Realms has set out to do and are simply doing what they can to help make it a reality. In September, we started to see some of the fruits of the new artist's labor. When character artist Tara Solbrig was brought onto the team, she was tasked with creating new character models, and by September was ready to showcase the new humans. Many of the previous character models that we've seen in gameplay streams were created by third parties and were not all made to the same specifications. That means, in order to have equipped armor visually appear on a character, Every armor model in the game would have to be manually fitted to every character body type. While VR's art team has grown a lot, it's still small compared to most MMO dev teams, so manually resizing every armor model for 9 different races simply wasn't an option. 
they decided to create a full set of character models that would allow armor models to scale automatically to fit them. Creating custom character models also means that they can better fit the style and lore of the world, as well as giving developers more control over character creation options and how the models are animated. There's no denying that the animations you've seen in Pantheon gameplay streams are janky. And that's largely because the old character models did not have rigging that made them easy to animate fluidly. You can think of rigging as the skeleton of bones inside a character model that allows it to move. An animator can manipulate those bones and program them to move in different directions at different times. Kind of like a puppeteer pulling the strings of a marionette doll. The more strings you have in key places, the more you can move it in believable ways, even down to subtle details in the face. Animator and regger Dwart Ferreira has set up the rigs in these new character models such that animations can easily be reused across all races, much like the armor models, which allows this still small team to make the most of their time. As of the recording of this video, the male and female models for the human and dark mirror are now complete, although we have not seen either of them in game yet. The remaining races are set to be made in the following order. In October, a new developer named Midvi quietly joined the official Pantheon Discord with the title of Game Designer. This hire was not announced in a newsletter or anything, but we later learned that his name is David Hamilton. This is a good example of how sometimes Visionary Realms will hire people without posting a job opening or even announcing it afterward. Sometimes hires are opportunistic, and the developer prefers to just stay out of the spotlight. But these hires still impact development, so it's worth keeping an eye out for. Especially now that game designers have more tools to add content to the game themselves. For example, David Hamilton has already been influential in adding a lot of new abilities for NPCs to use in combat. October was also when Vision Realms held the first pre-alpha test of the year. While the primary focus was on testing the stability of the new HDRP client and vinyl networking, this was also the first time testers were able to get their hands on the crafting and gathering systems, as well as combat improvements such as techniques. Techniques are an entirely new type of abilities that become available depending on what type of weapon you have equipped and how skilled you are with it. Seven of the 12 classes were available for this test, which is up from the six that were available in the test at the end of last year though all classes did receive updates to their stats and abilities. More importantly, this test saw over 500 testers in one zone on one server, thanks to Vinyl. The improved server size and stability opened the door for more frequent testing moving forward. A 24-hour pre-alpha test occurred on December 3rd and then again on December 10th. It was during this test that CoCarnage streamed unguided solo gameplay for the very first time. He just logged on, created a character, and played among everyone else that was online at that time. Visionary Realms also announced that pre-alpha tests like these would occur monthly starting in January 2023. Also in December, Visionary Realms hired a new community manager, Jamie Savanya Henry, as well as a new social media manager, Ruben Fire Pereira. Both have almost immediately increased engagement with the community through giveaways, screenshot releases, etc. By the way, Ben Kilson Walters, Pantheon's former community and social media manager, is still with the company, but has moved to a new position of conduct and security manager, where he specializes in handling cases of harassment, abuse, exploits, etc., both in and out of game. One thing I haven't touched on yet is world building, which has taken place gradually throughout the year. The pre-alpha tests this year all took place in the zone of Thronefast, but with all of the new artists, that isn't the only zone that was worked on behind the scenes. In addition to Throne Fast, significant progress was also made on Avendir's Pass and Wild's End. Now, it's difficult to gauge what that means unless you also know how many zones need to be complete for Alpha 1 to start. Unfortunately, Vision Realms hasn't publicly committed to that number yet, as it may change. What we do know is that this is the scale map of King's Reach, one of the three planned continents that make up the world of Terminus. The plan is to have this entire continent populated with content by the end of Alpha. But not all of it needs to be ready by the beginning of Alpha. How much? Again, we don't know. But we can see where Thronefast, Avendir's Pass, and Wild's End fit into this. It's worth pointing out though that that's just where the focus was this year. The rest of the zones on this map aren't just empty, as evidenced by this screenshot that was released in July of this year. 
This was taken from the middle of the Silent Plains looking east. So from this one vantage point in game, you can also see the overworld of the Eastern Plains, Avendir's Pass, Bronefast, Vale of Azeris, and Wild's End, about half of the continent. For a sense of scale, this tiny speck on top of this pillar called the Deicide Thorn is a human character model. And then there's the dungeons. Footage from Halnir Cave and Black Rose Keep has been shown since the refactor, just nothing new this year. Along those same lines, footage from Mad Run was revealed for the first time this year, but the alpha tracker and patch notes don't include any details about when this area was worked on. So it's unclear if this was done this year or if it was just done behind the scenes last year and only just revealed now. Either way, it may be worth keeping in mind that what's being shown on streams on the pre-alpha servers isn't everything that's being done behind the scenes. The developers have their own separate server where they work on things internally before the pre-alpha testers have access to them. But anyway, let's recap all this. $2.4 million was acquired from private investors. The main technological advancements were the completion of HDRP and Vinyl, both of which held up under testing by hundreds of pre-alpha testers, and Vinyl has even been licensed to other studios. Progress on world building such as environments, NPC placement, points of interest, quests, etc. was focused in three different zones, and two of the nine playable races have new character models, with the rest on the way. And one more class was made available for the three pre-alpha tests that took place this year, with monthly tests confirmed to take place starting in January 2023. I've mentioned nine new hires so far, but I should also point out that in September, Vision Realms posted a job opening on the website for a technical artist, which was taken down in November. It's unclear at this point if it was taken down because they hired someone for that role, or if that role is just no longer needed for some other reason. Anyway, it's significant that the nine confirmed people who joined Vision Realms this year are not replacements for people who left. These are new growth positions in the company. Despite the very understandable concerns over the length of Pantheon's development, facts like this very strongly suggest that Vision Realms shows no signs of closing up shop anytime soon, and is instead trying to push the accelerator. But before we wrap this up, I would be remiss if I did not address the elephant in the room. Imminence. This was the banner word that at the end of 2021, Pantheon's creative director Chris Joppa Perkins stated would be emblematic of Pantheon in 2022. What I'm excited about is 2022. Um, and I mean, I am, I am very excited about it. Uh, and the, the word that I would um, put on it, kind of the, the, the banner word I would put over 2022 as I thought about it is imminence. Um, We've been in development for a long time, so long, in fact, that the strides we're actually making right now are hard to really feel. It's hard to feel them, how significant they are, because we've been at this a long time. Um, it's, it is very clear if you're looking closely and you're looking deeply enough, it's clear to see, but I don't expect most people to do that. I mean, we, we all have lives that we're living, life is hard, and we're not, you know, we're not in this to like study the the fine grain ins and outs of you know the development cycle. We just want to know like is it happening? When's it happening? What's going on? So I get it. Um, but the corners that we're about to to turn, the the jumps that we're about to make moving into twenty two, um, as we draw closer to Alpha, as we, Alpha as we burn through more and more of that checklist, and those things are demonstrable and able to be experienced by our testers, able to be showcased in our streams, I firmly believe that 2022 will be a year of, of Pantheon's ever-increasing eminence, that to solidify that this game is coming, and when it gets here, it's gonna be an incredible experience. Um, so that, that's what I'm anticipating. Uh, you know, Obviously, I have Alpha in mind when I say that, because that's really the, the, the next milestone of all milestones. That's what we're all looking for and waiting for and hoping for. Um, and this year has been about getting us, you know, fully positioned and oriented to sprint towards that goal. And our hope is that everything we show will be further proof and building confidence that we are absolutely heading in that direction. And I think, I think it's just going to reach a tipping point soon where it's so much more clear that that's happening than not. 
So now, at the end of 2022, we must ask ourselves, has Pantheon fulfilled this prediction of imminence? Well, if you ask me, in a word, no. But also, sort of. Let me explain. If Joppa had simply left out the part where he said, I have Alpha in mind when I say this, he would have been spot on. Clearly, he was heavily implying that he imagined Pantheon being an Alpha by the end of 2022. And obviously, that has not happened. There is also still a very common sentiment among MMO players that Pantheon is nowhere near playable. As I said at the beginning of this video, Alpha is the ultimate proving ground. Most people need to see it to believe it. Between waiting for such a long time and maybe bad experiences with other projects, they can't feel that Pantheon is a real game until they can play it with their own two hands, or even talk about it without an NDA. So until that day, it will be near impossible for Visionary Realms to convince a large population of gamers that Pantheon has a bright future and is well on its way to release. That said, while Vision Realms may have not made it as blatantly obvious to the general public as they would have liked by the end of this year, the keen observer can see that Pantheon is a lot further along now than it was at the beginning of the year. The sole fact that Pantheon is now able to solidly support over 500 players concurrently in a single zone goes a long way toward showing that Pantheon is indeed a playable game. That's supported by the live stream that CoCarnage did in December, where he just logged onto the pre-alpha server and played with everyone else. Killing stuff, looting, selling, buying, leveling up, doing quests, upgrading abilities, climbing, sprinting, grouping, chatting, dying, all that good stuff. I saw a lot of comments that Ko's stream looked worse than the videos that came out even four or five years ago. And while that's pretty subjective, it also highlights one of the catch-22s of an open crowdfunded development process like this. You can't determine progress based only on how the game appears in videos. You see, the areas shown in Pantheon streams that came out in 2016 to 2018 were made almost entirely of third-party art assets bought from the Unity store. The art assets themselves aren't a problem and can be quite beautiful, but when they became overused, the game was not performant under any type of normal player load. So while it may have appeared that lots of beautiful areas were coming together quickly, it was in reality far from a launchable MMO. Now, with HGRP and vinyl and all sorts of other new systems under the hood, Pantheon for the first time can be considered a massively multiplayer online role-playing game. It runs smoothly and is enjoyed by several hundred people, all playing together on a regular basis. It's lacking a lot of content and polish, no doubt, and that will likely require funding from a publisher to get over the finish line. So again, a successful alpha is a must to truly achieve that level of imminence. But the events of this year have shown that Pantheon is closer to that than it ever has been. If you don't want to be out of the loop about Pantheon's development in 2023, hit the subscribe button now because this channel is dedicated to following it closely. If you want to make a difference in improving the quality and quantity of Bazgroom TV videos, click on the thanks button below this video or head over to our Patreon page. Either way, it'll be a big help and greatly appreciated. I hope you all have a safe and happy new year. I'll see you on the other side. Until then, stay curious and adventure on.